Hey everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with our weekly update on social media. Thank you as always for joining us. A lot going on at Judicial Watch. Our team is firing on all cylinders. Court hearings about Judicial Watch's lawsuit, about censorship of Judicial Watch on YouTube, uh, big victories on behalf of the parents' right to know, a uh, big court case next week uh, about a teacher who was fired for expressing the wrong views on transgenderism and Black Lives Matter. So much going on. Uh, plus, the left just continues to try to destroy the rule of law. I'll talk about that in Justice Thomas. Plus, some new Epstein information I think you're going to find very interesting. Uh, first up, I want to talk about the assault on the rule of law because, you know, our republic and everything we believe depends on having a constitutional republic, a republican form of government. And the republican form of government, at least in the American system, is contingent at the federal level of having three separate branches, co-equal but independent branches of government, uh, the judiciary, the legislature, and uh, the presidency. Well, the judiciary is supposed to apply the law, hopefully not in an activist way, uh, but the left has decided that the judiciary, because it is applying the law in a neutral way, needs to be destroyed. And namely, they're trying to destroy the Supreme Court with spurious ethics charges, ethics charges against uh, the conservatives on the court, basically making up rules that aren't being <laughs> making up rules um, uh, and then accusing uh, justices are violating those rules. So it's, it's complete Alice in Wonderland uh, uh, ethics analysis by the left. And of course, they don't care about the ethics. What they're trying to do is delegitimize the court uh, to make it easier to pack the court, which, as I've discussed, would end the court. Because when you hear court packing, just think about turning uh, the Supreme Court into the equivalent of Congress. Now. Do you think that Congress has conf people have confidence that Congress can uh, fairly apply the law or neutrally apply the law? Of course not. So why would you think that a Supreme Court the size of Congress with politicians just like congressmen on it would fairly apply the law? And that's but the left thinks that that's the way they can control the courts uh, by undermining uh, the rule of law and adherence to our Constitution. And the way they're doing that is by uh, tr making it, trying to make it impossible for justices to remain on the court through abuse and smearing and slander and defamation. And their number one target, and the target's changed from week to week. They've gone after virtually every uh, jurist who uh, has conservative inc inclinations, um, everyone from the Chief Justice Roberts to Gorsuch, and of course, the number one target now uh, is Justice Thomas. And I tell you, I've never seen anything like it uh, to have a series of stories, story after story, targeting Thomas, targeting Roberts, Tom, targeting Gorsuch, all about, as I said, these um, fake ethics concerns. And with Justice Thomas, you know, when he was first uh, nominated, uh, you had these false charges lay, uh, leveled against him with the help of Joe Biden, then a senator, uh, by Anita Hill. And Thomas was having no part of it. He went up there uh, to the Senate and famously testified and complained about the high-tech lynching. Uh, he was being uh, put through uh, by the media and by the leftist senators there. And it's never stopped. Uh, and it's expanded in recent days to target his wife, my friend Ginny Thomas, uh, his 94-year-old his 94-year-old mother, they're targeting her his grandnephew that he was uh, trying to help out and take care of, him, uh, Justice Thomas and his wife, Jenny. The high-tech lynching of Clarence Thomas has expanded to his family. And uh, the most recent attack is the suggestion that a friend of his, who happened to be a billionaire, uh, is, uh, was improperly subsidizing or giving him gifts that should have been reported uh, to help pay in part for the private school education of his grandnephew. His grandnephew, I guess, was having issues or was in difficult circumstances. So Justice Thomas and uh, Ginny Thomas, and I guess uh, the justice saw himself and his, his young relative, um, you know, took him in and helped him out and tried to provide him an education and, uh, you know, gave him the opportunities uh, they thought he needed in order to be successful. And that included private schooling. And he, they were having trouble, I guess, in the local schools. 
so uh, the local public school. So they talked to his friend, Harlan Crow, and he says, well, you know, I went to this great school. You should send him. And he offered to pay uh, the first, I guess, the first year of uh, tuition there. And somehow that becomes a reportable gift, even though under the rules, it's not a reportable gift. A, because it's from a friend, and B, it's not because it's not for an immediate family relative, like a daughter or a spouse or a son. And, uh, but that didn't stop uh, the left-wing activist group uh, uh, that publishes this, group, this uh, publication called ProPublica, uh, which, as I said, a left-wing advocacy group, uh, from running a story suggesting he did something wrong when, in fact, he did nothing wrong. And um, I'm frustrated because uh, although the Senate did have a hearing, uh, Democrats set up a hearing to try to destroy the Supreme Court earlier this week, uh, the Republicans did a relatively good job pushing back on it, uh, but they're not going to be cowed. The left isn't going to be cowed, as we saw following up on that hearing with this smear of Justice Thomas targeting um, his uh, grandnephew as well. And um, a lawyer for Justice Thomas and Ginny Thomas, Mark Paoletta, who happens to be a friend of ours as well, uh, issued a statement. And because the media isn't going to tell you about it, I'm going to read you the statement because Justice Thomas deserves a defense. And he not only personally deserves a defense because he's an American citizen who's being abused, but he deserves a defense because attacking Justice Thomas is attacking the Supreme Court, the rule of law, and our constitutional system. This is what Mark wrote. It was published on Twitter. We'll, pu we'll put a link to it. Uh, the Thomases have rarely spoken publicly about the remarkably generous efforts to help a child in need. They have always respected the privacy of this young man and his family. I guess the guy, um, his nephew is in his 30s now. It is disappointing and painful, but unsurprising that some journalists and critics cannot do the same. The Thomases quietly and honorably devoted 12 years of their lives to helping a beloved child in desperate need of love, support, and guidance. In 1997, Justice Thomas and his wife brought their great nephew to live with them. Uh, they agreed to take in this young child uh, much as Justice Thomas's grandparents had done for him and his brother in 1955. Justice Thomas's grandparents changed the trajectory of his life and the Thomases hoped to do the same for a child in need. Justice Thomas and his wife made immeasurable personal financial sacrifices and poured every ounce of their lives and hearts into giving their great nephew a chance to succeed. In the summer of 2006, the Thomases were struggling to find a school where they could send their great nephew. In discussing these challenges with their dear friends, Harlan and Kathy Crow, Harlan recommended that the Thomases consider one more option, sending their great nephew to Randolph-Macon Academy, which is in Virginia. Harlan had attended uh, the school and he thought that the school would be a good fit. Harlan had financially supported Randolph-Macon since the 1980s and funded scholarships for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. Harlan offered to pay the first year of Justice Thomas's grandnephew's tuition in 2006 and that payment went directly to the school. Harlan Crow's office confirmed that he did not pay the great nephew's tuition for any other year at Randolph-Macon. After some time, uh, the school recommended that the great nephew attend a boarding school in Georgia for one year. Harlan offered to pay the first year tuition for the great nephew at the Georgia school, and again, those tuition payments went directly to the school. By the next school year, uh, in 2009, the Thomas's great nephew returned to Randolph-Macon he moved back to the Savannah in, 2000 of, uh, in December of 2009 after he turned 18. The Thomases love their great nephew. It is despicable that the press has dragged him into their effort to smear Justice Thomas. This story is another attempt to manufacture a scandal about Justice Thomas, but let's be clear about what is supposedly scandalous now. Justice Thomas and his wife devoted 12 years of their lives to taking in and caring for a beloved child who was not their own, just as Justice Thomas's grandparents had done for them, for him. They made many personal financial sacrifices to do this, and along the way, their friends joined them in doing everything possible to give this child a future. Harlan Crow's tuition payments made directly to these schools on behalf of Justice Thomas, Justice Thomas's great nephew did not constitute a reportable gift. 
Justice Thomas was not required to disclose the tuition payments made directly to Randolph Macon and the Georgia School on behalf of his great nephew because the definition of a dependent child under the Ethics and Government Act does not include a great nephew. It is limited to a son, daughter, stepson, or stepdaughter. Justice Thomas never asked Harlan Crow to pay for his great nephew's tuition, and neither Harlan Crow nor his company had any business before the Supreme Court. This malicious story shows nothing except for the fact that the Thomases and the Crows are kind, generous, and loving people who tried to help this young man. So that's the story. A wealthy friend of the Thomases helped them pay tuition, directed the monies directly to the school. Uh, under the ethics rules, they weren't required to report the gift, it seems to me, on two levels. A, it wasn't a covered person, meaning the great nephew wasn't his son, uh, and therefore reportable, the gift was reportable. And secondly, because it was a friend, the gift probably was never generally reportable anyway, even if it could be attributable to something directly to the benefit of Justice Thomas or a direct member of his family. So a lot of noise about nothing, right? Uh, but that's not going to stop the left from calling for the impeachment and removal of Thomas. It's not going to stop the left from uh, trying to harass and intimidate the Supreme Court. And remember, they're in the middle of making some very sensitive decisions right now. So this is part of that as well, intimidating the current decision making of the Supreme Court. So, um, uh, and as we talked about um, either uh, last week or, or a few weeks ago, uh, we have this constant threat of violence that the left has uh, used or is using against the justices of the Supreme Court by illegally protesting outside their homes. Now, I don't know about you, but if someone came to your home, that's a sign to uh, most any sensible person and starts protesting, we know where you live. And sure enough, Justice Kavanaugh, uh, someone showed up outside his home, was near his home, and by his own admission to the police, according to reports, allegedly said he was there to kill him. So Justice Kavanaugh was nearly assassinated, uh, the guy who's charged with attempted murder, um, as a result of the failures, in my view, of the police, and um, specifically uh, the Garland Justice Department to uh, defend the rule of law, uh, which prohibits uh, this intimidation campaign, uh, which has violence as its basis uh, against the sitting justices. And as uh, Justice Alito said, you know, this, uh, this leak that took place of the Dobbs decision, you know, made them all targets of assassination. And the Justice Department and the Biden White House not only has, have done nothing to enforce the law to better protect them, they've encouraged the protests, which as best I can tell, haven't really stopped. So these are dangerous times for our republic. I say it once, I'll say it again. Uh, and when you see these attacks on Justice Thomas or other conservative justices of the Supreme Court, uh, you, you got to know it's deadly serious. And it's not about ethics at the court level because they don't care about the ethics of the liberals on the court. You know, and I'm not suggesting any of the liberals, quote, are unethical in terms of what they've done in terms of finances or gift reports and forms and such. I'm just telling you, all discussions, practically speaking, about the Supreme Court and ethics are designed to undermine the legitimacy of the court, are not designed to instill confidence in the fair administration of justice. They're designed to advance the destruction of the Supreme Court, the rule of law, and our constitutional system in a way that could end the country as we know it. And so Judicial Watch is not going to be intimidated. We're not going to back down. We have a lawsuit investigating the failure to provide security and enforce the law for the justices who are under the gun from the left at their homes. And of course, we're educating the public as best we are able and defending the rule of law and, def and defending folks like Justice Thomas against these spurious attacks. And I encourage you to make it a priority uh, when you talk to senators. So what are you doing to defend Justice Thomas? What are you do doing to defend the rule of law? Uh, under, that's under attack from, from the left because there are a few of the senators who are doing it, but most others don't care much about it. To me, it ought to be a priority.
So communicate with your senators by calling 202-225-3121. Same thing goes for the House. There's oversight of the Justice Department uh, out of the House of Representatives as well. These are serious times. And so Judicial Watch isn't going to stop. We're not going to back down, as I said, uh, under, um, because uh, we, we don't want the country to end, <laughs> to be blunt. Uh, there was another big story this week that I think is interesting, and I don't want uh, to overstate how interesting it is, but it's interesting enough for me to share. And uh, uh, it was a Wall Street Journal report this week that was really quite extraordinary. Evidently, they got a hold of Epstein, um, Jeffrey Epstein's private calendars, and they show what looks to me a lot of unusual meetings with some very interesting people. The nation's spy chief, the story opens, a former, a longtime college president and a top women in finance, the circle of people who associated with Jeffrey Epstein years after he was convicted, uh, was a convicted sex offender is wider than previously reported. Now, first up of great interest is William Burns, who is currently the CIA director as appointed by Joe Biden. Um, he's been there since 20, uh, I guess 2021, since the beginning of the administration. Uh, and he was Deputy Secretary of State under Obama. And while he was there, according to these documents, he met with uh, Epstein, it looks like three times, uh, including um, at his townhouse in Manhattan. Isn't that interesting? Catherine uh, Rumler a White House counsel under Barack Obama, so he, she was the top lawyer for the Obama White House, had dozens of meetings with Epstein in the years after her White House service and before she became a top lawyer at Goldman Sachs. Uh, Leo Bostein, the president of uh, Bard College, an influential big college there, invited Epstein, uh, who brought a group of young female guests to the campus. So they were trying to raise money from him at Bard College. And um, of course, you know, none of these names are supposedly in the black book or the list of people who flew to his island, right? Uh, but um, the uh, unusual s visits here, I think, are striking. And we have the current CIA chief, then top official in the Obama administration, meeting three times with this guy who was a convicted sex offender. Boy, isn't that interesting? I, 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 can't, I can't imagine what the, what the heck was going on there, or maybe I can, which is even more disturbing. And the White House counsel lawyer, the former lawyer, I mean, he, she was meeting with him pretty regularly. Very unusual. But what's interesting about Wimler is that uh, she says, uh, or I don't know if she says it, but the Wall Street Journal reports that she, he, she first met, again, this is Obama's top lawyer at the White House after she left the White House, first met Epstein after he called her to ask if she would be interested in representing Mr. Gates and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the Goldman Sachs spokesman said. So I guess it's uh, Goldman Sachs who admitted this. A spokeswoman for Mr. Gates and Epstein uh, said Epstein never worked for Mr. Gates, misrepresented their relationship, but that Mr. Gates regrets ever meeting with him. And as you may know, the reports are that um, his family was unhappy with him over the meet Gates' meetings with Epstein. Epstein and his staff discussed whether Ms. Rumler, now 52, would be uncomfortable with the presence of young women who worked as assistants and staffers at the townhouse. Women emailed... Um, Epstein on two occasions to ask if they should avoid the home while she was there. Epstein told one of the women he didn't want her around and another one that it wasn't a problem. Rimmler didn't see anything that would lead her to be concerned at the townhouse and didn't express any concern, the Goldman Sachs people said. So uh, the other interesting folk, uh, the other interesting person who met with her is the other interesting person who met with uh, Epstein, according to the news calendar, these new calendars, is Ariane de Rothschild, who is now chief executive of the Swiss private bank Edmund de Rothschild Group. The bank hired Ms. Rumler's law firm after the introduction to help with U.S. regulatory matters, according to the bank and, uh, the, Goldman, and, and the Goldman Sachs spokesman. So you had this connection between Rumler, Goldman Sachs, excuse me, Rumler, the Rothschild Bank, and Epstein. 
Now, Epstein's um, meetings with Rothschild were denied initially by the bank, and in fact, that was a lie. This is what they said. The bank acknowledged to the journal that its earlier statement wasn't accurate, that Ms. Rothschild never met with Epstein and had no business links with him. Well, she did have business links with him and did meet with him. So uh, to me, this all explains something. You know, people have asked, why hasn't the government seemed very interested in investigating, given the nature of what Epstein was doing, the folks around Epstein, who, was, who were likely to have been involved with him and may have seen something untoward or participated in something untoward with young women? Well, this all, this helps explain it. So some of the folks implicated, other than, you know, the Clinton gang, as usual, is the, are, are folks from the Obama gang including Biden's current CIA chief and Obama's type white, top White House lawyer. So it certainly helps explain to me why their seemingly lack of interest in what Epstein was up to and who he was dealing with. And uh, kudos to the Wall Street Journal for getting these calendars. Uh, Judicial Watch is looking into other issues related to Epstein. You can be sure we'll report to you if we're able to find anything or if we do anything substantively legally to try to find something. Uh, but uh, these are very interesting calendars. I encourage you to go on, uh, look up the story about it. We'll provide a link. Uh, but uh, now the CIA director is implicated in the Jeffrey Epstein scandals. Uh, boy, uh, there has to be some investigations of that, and you can be sure Judicial Watch will be in on it. Judicial Watch had a big find uh, come out this week about Qatar. Uh, well, you may have followed our litigation, hard fought, over years uh, on behalf of uh, the uh, SACOR uh, 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 Legal Institute, which is a US-based advocacy group dedicated to combating the spread of anti-Semitism and frankly terrorism. Uh, they had been trying to get records about Qatar, which is a foreign, um, uh, the terrorist link regime from the Middle East, their funding of Texas A&M University. And what had happened was, and I'm kind of summarizing this broadly, uh, that uh, their request to Texas A&M was rejected or was, was uh, uh, interfered with, practically speaking, because the Qatar Foundation, which is the front for the government, didn't want the documents coming out. So they were suing in state court and it went up and down the courts in Texas uh, and with Judicial Watch successfully ultimately representing the Zakor Legal Institute. And now we know what they were hiding. A judicial Watch uncovered the records uh, that were released to us as a result of the court order, specifically released to the Zakor uh, Legal Institute, uh, that Texas A&M had gotten, it looks like $485 million, close to $500 million in grants and contracts from the Qatar Foundation. And there also appear to be discrepancies between what is listed in the gift reporting uh, received from Texas A&M and what was reported by the school to the federal foreign gift reporting system. For instance, Texas A&M's gift record for January 1st, 2013 through May 22nd, 2018 uh, only lists a total of $69 million from the Qatar Foundation. Uh, whereas the Department of Education's database shows a total of over $47 million for the same period. And we're now talking, you know, under reporting of nearly $400 million or over $400 million. And no matter how you slice it, it looks like. As I said, the new information was released um, thanks to a court victory last month in litigation on behalf of the, the Secor Legal Institute uh, under the Texas Public Information Act. Just so you know, we have the federal FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act, but then all the states have their variations of FOIA, the Freedom of Information Act. Either they call it the Public Records Act, Public Information Ra Act, Right to Know Law, you name it. But it's all transparency. And sometimes these state laws can get you documents even more quickly, well, it's pretty easy to do, to get you documents more quickly than the federal law. Uh, but uh, it's a powerful tool, and I encourage you all to use it where possible. Uh, and uh, they've been asking for these records about the Qatar funding of uh, the Texas A&M University. And plus, they've got a big campus at, uh, uh, in Qatar as well. 
The previously hidden records include a document entitled Guitar Grants and Contracts for January 1st, 2013 through May 22nd, 2018, which is the time frame that I was talking about with their federal reporting. Uh, it shows Guitar Computing Research Institute gave $121 million. The documents show um, that the Qatar National Research Fund, for instance, gave them $32 million. The Qatar Foundation gave them $485 million. So, you know, that's well north of $500 billion, if my math is um, accurate here. And I don't trust my math, but it seems readily apparent to me. Qatar University gave them a, almost a quarter of a million dollars. Uh, they've got a second record. Uh, also detailing records or, or gifts of uh, totaling another $3 million from various entities related to Qatar. So that's a lot of money. And uh, it's an extraordinary amount of money. Don't you agree? And as I said in our comment, uh, now we know why terrorist link Qatar has fought us in court to hide its financial support for Texas A&M. Because it's a half a billion dollars. I mean, it wasn't like a grant for a million bucks. Now, you know, th I'm sure some of you follow grant making to universities. You notice when they happen, big grants get made to certain universities. I mean, $500 million, I, I didn't look and compare it to other, you know, is it a record gift? I doubt it, but certainly it's up there. The TAR has aligned itself with Islamic terrorists and extremists which has placed it at odds with the United States, Israel, and other U.S. allies in the Middle East. So we've got a public interest in figuring out what's going on here. And our, our friends at the Saqqara Legal Institute began asking for these records five years ago, in 2018. And it's really, it's terrible that they've had to wait so long. And, um, you know, Texas A&M, in my view, probably could have released the information more directly since then, but they were uh, suggesting they couldn't do it because of the lawsuit that Qatar filed to prevent disclosure of the funding information. Uh, we countered in the courts that neither the Qatari government nor any of its agencies are protected by exceptions under Texas law and that federal law expressly makes the requested information public, meaning the foreign funding. And in March of 2023, just last month, uh, Judge Amy Clark Meekham ruled in favor of Judicial Watch and the Zakhar Legal Institute in order that the documents be made public. So this is a five-year um, uh, uh, litigation that went up and down. I think it went to the Texas Supreme Court or the equivalent. And so uh, now we know something very significant, that this foreign government tied to terrorism has an outsized influence, it looks like, based on $500 million granted to Texas A&M University. And uh, the next question is, well, what, what are they getting in return for that, if anything? You know, usually donors want, uh, you know, a legacy, right? In the least, something named. Or scholarships, was certain programs demanded? I don't know. Certain access to certain programs? I don't know. But I think this is next up in terms of the investigation. And these are, this is what our clients said. Thanks to the determined and skillful work of Judicial Watch, the country now sees the extent to which foreign governments are interfering in American institutions, said Mark Greendorfer, who is president of the Zakhar Legal Institute. Texas A&M's apparent sporadic and shifting compliance with federal reporting requirements concerning gifts and grants from Qatar raised many questions as to why the university seemingly failed to comply with reporting requirements and whether additional information is not being reported. Zakhar will continue to pursue answers to these questions until every dollar is accounted for. So our, our lawyer on this case was Michael Bakesha. We were assisted. Uh, Michael is a senior attorney here at Judicial Watch. Uh, he was assisted uh, by um, our Texas counsel, uh, Jennifer S. Riggs of Riggs and Ray in Austin, Texas. So thank you, Jennifer, for helping us. And we had some other attorneys there helping us in Texas as we were appealing it appealing some of these rulings initially. So this is a big deal. Actually, we weren't appealing the rulings. I think the Qataris were appealing the rulings. And they had more money than you Midas in terms of being able to uh, fight us. But the rule of law won. So this David Goli versus Goliath uh, exercise resulted in David again winning. 
uh, against the Qatari government. And so, um, you know, this is, this is not a minor issue uh, because it's not the Qataris, it's not Qatar that is just funding U.S. universities. We've got the Chinese very much interested in having a footprint here, the Saudis, other foreign governments, and we need more disclosure about that. We don't want to lose our country to these uh, foreign governments who are exercising influence uh, through dramatic gifts to academic institutions. And, uh, you know, we have a right to sovereignty, don't we? And one way to protect our sovereignty is to ensure that we know what foreign governments are doing with the institutions, certainly, that train our children. And, you know, the academic institutions at issue often have very sensitive access to national security and other secrets that we don't want foreign nationals or foreign governments having access to. So there's a national security component to this as well. So Judicial Watch um, is going to continue to pursue this issue with Texas A&M, I suspect, plus there are other issues with the Department of Education and uh, the numbers they've been tracking that we're going to be pursuing as well. So, and plus, if you are aware of this type of activity at a university you support and you're concerned about it, send us the detail. Maybe we can look into it. So as I was saying earlier, uh, the states have Freedom of Information Act laws, including in Tennessee. And I know many Americans have been concerned about getting access to the manifesto, the so-called manifesto, allegedly written by the murderer of those six innocents in Texas last month at the Covenant School. And for whatever reason, uh, the Memphis Police Department, I do know the reason, they've told us, has been withholding this manifesto. And the concern is that it's being withheld because the shooter, a woman, uh, supposedly was transgendered or whatever, and people are thinking that is this an example of transgender extremist violence and that her manifesto or whatever her journal is uh, would disclose that and you know, raise issues for the left they'd rather not deal with. So is there a political reason for withholding this information? And secondly, there's a big issue as always when there is a mass shooting of uh, the government uh, and the left uh, trying to confiscate guns, ban guns, and come after the civil rights uh, protected under the Second and Fourteenth Amendment uh, related to gun ownership and uh, use and, you know, bearing arms and all of that. So we've seen the obvious public interest in getting access to this information. So we we worked to get access to the information. And we were stonewalled. And we sued. And I know people are saying, well, is Judicial Watch going to do something about it? Usually, yes, we will do something about it, certainly if we can. And we announced a public records lawsuit for records about the uh, March 27th, 2023 shooting at the Covenant, the Covenant School in Tennessee, including the reported manifesto uh, written by the female shooting suspect. And it's, she's not really a suspect. The police have concluded that she was the murderer, obviously. The suit is against the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County and the Chancery Court for the state of Tennessee's 20th District. On April 13, 2023, the Tennessee Firearms Association, one of Judicial Watch's clients, submitted two open records requests. The first request asked for the Metropolitan Nashville Police Department's uh, copies of records or files um, and inspection of the manifesto reportedly found in the home of Audrey Elizabeth Hall on March 27, 2023. And the second request asked that the police produce copies of the records or files and inspection of uh, all email communications of Memphis police officials regarding the mass shooting committed by Hall on March 27th, as, law, as well as their text messages and copies of the manifesto. So we wanted everything, right? Supposedly something was found in her home, something was found in her vehicle. We wanted to cover all bases. The other request was broader. It was on behalf of uh, a retired Hamilton County, Tennessee Sheriff James Hammond uh, Hammond requested um, all police reports documenting the incident. Essentially, we want the file. And I, I could list everything, but we want the file. Uh, we want the manifesto. Uh, the sheriff knows what he's asking about. He's a well-respected man down there. And it's just unbelievable that we're having to go to court to sue for this. And uh, I told you why we're concerned there are politics behind this. 
Tennessee authorities have cited no credible reason for hiding the killer's manifesto about this deadly shooting of three young children and three school employees. Uh, politics shouldn't trump transparency in the public safety. The public has an urgent right to know the details of this manifesto, that a public records lawsuit is required to try to access this key document is a scandal. And uh, when I say about the public safety, if you know what motivates folks and you know there are issues, well, that can help you figure out when other folks are uh, contemplating violence and whether you should be taking those, those uh, issues seriously. You know, the reasons and motivations and this type of documentation contributes to the uh, public safety because it helps uh, ensure, in theory, that it won't happen again or it might be prevented in the future. And obviously, it will inform the public debate about what to do about this, right? Some folks want gun control. Uh, there's this debate about transgender extremism and its effect on those going through these treatments and these processes or in the thrall of what I call this transgender extremist ideology. You know, all of that is going to be informed uh, by the release of these public documents. And as I said, they're public documents. We're not asking for secret documents. Documents like these are typically released. You may recall they quickly released the video showing the heroic and inspiring uh, video of those police officers going into the school and taking this killer out. And I don't know if you've seen the video, but it's, it's not pleasant to watch. Uh, but God, God bless those police officers. And, um, but, but we want everything else. And uh, the fact that they released that video and not this other material suggests there's politics involved. And maybe the documents will show that some politicians or they were uh, interfered with or there were political concerns that prevented the release contrary to law of these documents. So uh, the court is acting quickly. She has set a hearing for May 18th. So before you know it, we will have a hearing. And what's really interesting is that the police department put out a statement saying, oh, we can't release these documents because of the litigation. And I said to a reporter the other day, I said, well, on what planet does a request for documents somehow mean that they can't release the documents quickly? Are they suggesting, you know, it's, it, it should be just the opposite. A lawsuit should add, land urgency to releasing the documents under law. But now uh, their latest excuse is that asking for the documents and suing for the documents means they can't release the documents as quickly as they otherwise would, which I've been doing this work for longer than I care to admit to. Uh, that's the first time I've ever heard that excuse. Hundreds, hundreds of Freedom of Information Act lawsuits. I've never heard a government agency say, our lawsuit is slowing down the release of the records. Un incredible, incredible. So it makes me even more suspicious that they're hiding something or it's being hidden inappropriately in the least. So uh, when that pops up, when we get those documents, and I think we will get these documents, we'll be sure to let you know. So I've talked about how uh, FOIA is available to uh, citizens at the state and local level. You can sue or request documents under FOIA. And what the left has gone crazy about, uh, they love, they, by the way, they love FOIA. They used to love FOIA until conservatives or the wrong political class started using it. And now, for instance, we hear about the weaponization of FOIA by parents who are demanding, having the temerity to demand information about what their schools are teaching their children and what policies are in their schools and what books are in their schools. And they don't want to comply with the FOIA laws. And they want to change the FOIA laws to prevent access to government information about what the, teacher, what, what the children are being taught at schools. It's unbelievable. It just shows you the left doesn't believe virtually in any good thing they say they believe in. They don't believe in transparency. They don't believe in the First Amendment. They want to restrict your right to know. Of course, if they want to know something, you know, all bets are off. But if you do, they'll shut it down. We see that every day at Judicial Watch. In Pennsylvania, our client Megan Brock saw this more directly because, believe it or not, in some states, as we noted in Texas, parties can sue to stop the disclosure of records. And what the Pucks County, Pennsylvania did to our client was they sued her repeatedly 
to stop her request for records from going forward. And a judge ruled in our favor, or ruled in the favor of Megan Brock, the heroic uh, mother who um, uh, was sued by Bucks County, and they ruled, or the court ruled, that Bucks County acted in bad faith in withholding school COVID shutdown documents, and the court ordered, at least in two cases, uh, that legal fees totaling $3,000 be paid. As I note in the release, uh, the judge ruled that the county acted in bad faith, as I said, in withholding records that are by law public, okay? Public records from Megan Brock, a parent represented by Judicial Watch, who was sued by Bucks County to prevent the release of documents related to COVID restrictions and the reopening of the county schools that she requested under the Commonwealth's right to know law. So Pennsylvania is in a state, it's a Commonwealth. I'm sure, so everyone in Pennsylvania, you don't have to contact me, I know the difference. In each of the two lawsuits filed by Buck County, uh, Judge uh, Bauman, uh, B-O-W-M-A-N, ruled on April 28th that the county must produce records uh, Brock had requested under the right to know law. Uh, she also ruled that the county pay sanctions in the amount of $1,500 in each of the lawsuits, and that's the highest amount allowable under law. The court conducted an in-camera review of the records. In-camera means the judge looks at them privately, uh, and uh, found that more than half were not properly withheld by Bucks County and ordered the release of several records. The, county, the court also considered evidence submitted by Brock to the Office of Open Records, which consisted of records that Brock obtained from another request that should have been what were not produced in the record searches in the lawsuits. The court agreed that these evidentiary records demonstrated that Bucks County had failed to produce documents which clearly existed, fell within the right to know requested issue, and were not protected from disclosure uh, by exemption. So what had happened was they withheld documents in one case, Megan found the documents in another lawsuit and said, or another request, and said, well, uh, these are the same type of documents I should have gotten in this other case. And the court agreed. These court decisions are tremendous victories for the right to know of parents and citizens. Indeed, the court recognized the bad faith nature of the outrageous government lawsuits against our client, Megan Brock, for daring to ask questions about crazed COVID school shutdowns. And, you know, she was just asking basic information. On February 7th of 2022, she sent a right to know request asking for all uh, correspondence by uh, the PR person there and the vice chair of the board, the board chair, the director of the commissioner's office of public information, the chief clerk and the health department director. On, um, For example, uh, she asked, like, give me one email about this uh, uh, school guidance document related to uh, COVID-19 and shutting schools down or keeping them open. Quote, the Bucks County COVID-19 amended school guidance. Just one email. It was a fight. So uh, I know Megan's pleased about getting this information. In July 2022, National Review profiled Brock and Jamie Walker, uh, two parents, uh, you know, Jamie is another parent in Bucks County, who led the fight to reopen the county school during the COVID pandemic and then to keep the schools open and opening close to normal, which as you know, is part of the, part of the uh, secret sauce there because they pretended the left did, well, we want the schools to be open, but they would have been open in a way that would have turned them into prisons for the children there under these crazed COVID restrictions. Brock and Walker suspect county officials and two Democratic commissioners had a hand in updating the county's guidance and possibly overruling their own health director, a strong advocate for in-person learning. They believe Pennsylvania Governor Tom Wolf's administration coerced the county into adopting its more restrictive COVID policies and its one-size-fit-all approach to school reopening. So that's what she was looking for. And we're pleased that she's getting now a, a group of the records um, from that lawsuit uh, or those law, uh, excuse me, she just asked for them and she got sued. So we had to go in and defend her. Thankfully, the court agreed that she should get at least some of the records that they've withheld. So we'll see what comes out of that. And you can bet that Megan Brock, who now is also a fledging reporter at The Daily Caller, is going to continue to demand her right to know under law and you can bet we will support her where we can. So a great victory for Judicial Watch 
and parents everywhere, remember you have a right to know what your schools are up to and that they're giving you the runaround or you just want to know how to do it, I encourage you to contact Judicial Watch. That's what we do. We help you figure out how to figure out what your government's up to. So this critical race theory insanity uh, is bad enough in our schools. This transgender extremism is bad enough in our schools. But uh, the First Amendment violations that go with targeting those who uh, criticize what's going on in the schools is uh, something that is so egregious. There's uh, Judicial Watch has uncovered the targeting of teachers, uh, parents, uh, and you've seen story after story about even children being punished for daring to oppose uh, the left-wing woke virus in our schools. And Judicial Watch has been pursuing a federal lawsuit on behalf of a teacher who was fired months after, actually for comments she made before she was hired, about transgenderism, uh, the transgender extremist movement, and uh, the critical race theory movement, all of which is um, are, are left-wing revolutionary attacks on uh, not only children, but on America generally. And uh, we've... Uh, had this lawsuit going on for some time now uh, on behalf of uh, Carrie McRae, who is a Massachusetts high school teacher who, as I said, was fired in retaliation from posts on social media that predated her employment at Hanover High School up in Massachusetts. Uh, there's going to be a hearing on a summary judgment motion, meaning they're just trying to get the case ended uh, next Tuesday or uh, next week up in uh, Boston. Uh, Judicial Watch's court filing laying out the First Amendment retaliation issues and evidence uncovered through several months of discovery, including deposition testimony, is available on our website. I'm sure we can provide a link to you below. So what had happened was uh, the teacher comes to us, we sue on her behalf, uh, the case proceeds, we start gathering documents, our lawyers start taking depositions, uh, and uh, now what they want to do is shut the case down before it goes to trial. They say, we haven't been able to produce enough evidence to suggest anything went wrong and no jury uh, needs to decide any facts uh, uh, or there are no real facts that are in dispute. And obviously we dispute the fact that there are facts. <laughs> Wait, and obviously we dispute whether there are facts in dispute, which is a big deal at the summary uh, judgment stage. So. Uh, just so you know, they're just trying to shut the case down and uh, they don't want to go to trial and we believe our client has uh, more than enough evidence uh, for a jury to discover or to dispute. Excuse me. We believe our client has more than enough evidence that a jury should be able to evaluate um, uh, over whether she was retaliated against. The evidence is that she was fired, as I said, in retaliation for exercising her First Amendment right to speak on issues of public concern, like critical race theory and transgenderism in school. She deserves her day in court. So McRae was hired as a Hanover High School teacher on August 31st, 2021, but was fired over several TikTok posts that were made months prior to her hiring at the school. McRae was elected to the Bourne School Committee and made the posts in her personal capacity as a citizen and candidate for public office. So, you know, she didn't even make the videos as a high school teacher. And the videos were relatively straightforward. There was nothing weird about them that would require her not to be allowed to teach school. And it was just obvious retaliation for holding the wrong types of views on, on public policy debates. And uh, so now we've got a federal civil rights case over it. And there's been a lot of work by our, our, our attorney team to gather the evidence on her behalf. Uh, so pray for wisdom and discernment for the judge uh, that she uh, rules in our favor and allows the case to proceed. So the hearing's next week. And once we get word as to how it goes one way or another, I'll be sure to let you know. In the meantime, Judicial Watch has got other lawsuits. Uh, we have a case in Illinois on behalf of a teacher who was fired for Facebook posts she made while she was on vacation, just commenting on Black Lives Matter. Just crazy stuff. 
we've had um, another case in Massachusetts that settled uh, with an apology, it looks like, practically speaking, to our client, uh, Coach Flynn. Uh, he was fired as a high school football coach because he complained about Black Lives Matter propaganda in his child's seventh grade world civilization class or something like that, you know, completely inappropriate. And so uh, that case resulted in a settlement. But here, we're still fighting, and uh, let's see how it ends up. But this critical race theory contagion is serious. They're targeting our children, and if you dare get in the way, they'll come after you, as our clients are showing. And uh, this is why parents have got to be on watch at the school board level, understand what's in your curriculum, don't accept what they t are telling you about the curriculum at face value because they disguise their agenda by using different descriptors of what is essentially something that is wildly objectionable. Racialist repackaged Marxism being force fed our children. So uh, you, can't, you can't ease up at all as these cases are showing. Well, Judicial Watch is doing a, a lot of heavy lifting next week. We also have another federal court hearing over a major censorship case we brought against the California Secretary of State's office for uh, their causing YouTube to censor yours truly, well, actually Judicial Watch. I was just talking on the Judicial Watch video. Um, uh, and the video was about election integrity issues and the censorship occurred just before the 2020 election. So not only in my view is it a violation of our First Amendment rights, that's the allegation in the lawsuit, but it is election interference. And the California Secretary of State's office, Judicial Watch uncovered through Freedom of Information Act requests, uh, and frankly other entities it looks like, were uh, doing everything they can to suppress any criticism of the changes in election procedures and the desire for election integrity in the run-up to the 2020 election. They were going to Twitter, they were going to YouTube, they, they had all ins and has been exposed in the Twitter files, all sorts of connections with all sorts of, uh, all the big tech media companies to censor Americans. And specifically, Judicial Watch found in these documents produced to us by the California Secretary of State that Judicial Watch's video was specifically targeted. And this is what we found out in um, and this is why we sued. So this is, this is the background. In um, September of 2020, Judicial Watch posted on our YouTube channel a video titled Election Integrity Crisis, Dirty, Voting Ro Dirty Voter Rolls, Ballot Harvesting, and Mail-in Ballot Risk! Exclamation point. The 26-minute minute video featured Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton, me, discussing the vote-by-mail processes, changes to state election procedures, ballot collection, sometimes referred to as ballot harvesting, and states' failures to clean up their voter rolls, among other topics. The complaint states that Fitton's comments, this is the lawsuit we filed, uh, and we describe why we filed it, uh, was informed by successful lawsuits brought by Judicial Watch against Los Angeles County and the Secretary of State's office in 2017 to compel the county and state to comply with the National Voter Registrations Act voter list maintenance requirements. For instance, in June 2019, Judicial Watch was informed that Los Angeles County had sent notices to 1.6 million inactive voters. In fact, we were just informed last, was it in February now? Yeah, in February we announced and had it confirmed to us by the California Secretary of State's office in Los Angeles County that indeed they did remove those names from the rolls. So not only did they begin the process of removal, but the removal has happened, a remarkable historic uh, settlement. Prior to the California Settlement Agreement, Judicial Watch estimated that national census data and voter roll information showed that there were 3.5 million more names of various county voter rolls nationwide than there were citizens of voting age. So, you know, just straightforward analysis of the issue of dirty names on the voter rolls. And the general concern is that dirty election rolls can mean dirty elections. It increases the opportunity for fraud. That's why federal law requires states to take reasonable steps to clean up the rolls, and that's why we sue when we find states aren't doing so. Records show the Office of Election Cybersecurity communicated with YouTube uh, and Google, well, Google owns YouTube, to have Judicial Watch's video taken down. And this is, these are the smoking guns here. On September 24, 2020, uh, the social media coordinator over in this office 
emailed civil, civic outreach at google.com and copied four YouTube employees with the subject line, report video election integrity crisis, listing Judicial Watch's title for the video. In the email, uh, the government official wrote, hi YouTube reporting team, I, re I am reporting the following video because it misleads community members about elections or other civic processes and misrepresents the safety and security of mail-in ballots. Thank you for your time and attention to this matter. And then the rep representative from YouTube writes, thanks for reaching out, we will look into this. Later that same day, Judicial Watch noticed the video had been taken down. So she sends the email on September 24th. The next day, they respond and the email gets taken down. And then on September 27th, they confirm, helpfully, that they did what they asked. Circling back on this, thank you for raising this content to our attention. This has been removed from the platform for violating our, pro our policies. Please do not hesitate to reach out if there are other, any other questions or concerns you may have. So that's a violation of our First and Fourteenth Amendment rights. You can't cause our videos to be censored. Smoking gun documents show California government officials who were being advised, by the way, the Biden PR operation was, whole, was part of this California Secretary of State operation to censor us. They were using the same PR firm to quote advise them on this. So Biden's campaign, his PR firm, was working with California's Secretary of State to censor Judicial Watch. So there's no doubt that these, this gang was involved in causing YouTube to censor our video just before the 2020 election. This egregious government censorship and election interference violated our civil rights and your civil rights if you're a Judicial Watch supporter, I would, I would submit. And our lawsuit seeks to stop and expose the growing corruption of leftist government officials colluding with big tech allies to attack the free speech rights of American citizens. So we have a big hearing on this next week. Uh, the state of California says our case shouldn't proceed. They filed what is called a motion to dismiss. They're suggesting they have a government free speech right to tell companies to censor American citizens. I mean, how do you like that for Orwellian logic? And obviously we disagree, so the court's gonna have to decide. We uh, highlighted uh, in the brief supposing uh, that outrageous legal position by the California Secretary of State's office uh, that they're violating our First Amendment rights again by misusing of their authority under the California law with the intention to interfere with our speech by A, monitoring our speech, falsely assessing our speech as misleading, ignoring an express limitation on their authority while giving an overly broad interpretation to so-called other authority and using their close working relationship with and dedicated pathways at YouTube to have our video removed within approximately 24 hours of their request. California government officials don't have the right to censor any American especially on sensitive election integrity debates just before a presidential election. California's censorship of Judicial Watch is a violation of the First Amendment, pure and simple. So we'll see what the court does. Hopefully the court allows the case to proceed. As you may know, it's kind of tough to sue uh, these uh, big tech entities or frankly the governments that are behind the censorship uh, in court. Um, I think this is a great case though. It's pretty direct. We've got the document showing the government asked YouTube to take our video down and they did. I mean, that is censorship um, 101 in terms of what's not supposed to happen under our constitution. And so we hope the federal court judge allows it to go forward. The hearing I think is on Thursday, so maybe I can give you an update as to how it goes. It's sometimes the judges at these hearings make decisions on the bench and they tell you what they're going to do. Usually they just take everything, quote, under advisement. They leave the bench and then issue a ruling subsequently. This civil rights lawsuit is part of a massive effort by Judicial Watch to both expose and stop the worst assaults on the First Amendment I would submit in American history. There has been no other scandal 
uh, related to the First Amendment and suppression of free speech in which so many Americans have been um, affected. Millions of Americans to this day are being suppressed as a result of censorship with the Biden administration pressing uh, big tech to censor Americans. You have these big tech companies not censoring Americans because they violated any rules uh, that are sensible under their own uh, uh, content policies, but because they're being pressured. The Twitter files have shown that government is behind much of the censorship that you still are suffering on platforms like Facebook and Google, et cetera. And uh, that's one of the reasons they've been so interested in uh, destroying Elon Musk, because he's committed to freer speech on Twitter. He's exposed this corruption in more direct ways um, and followed, frankly, Judicial Watch's lead in transparency, which is quite remarkable. Uh, so uh, uh, they can't take free speech. They don't like free speech. They hate free speech. They oppose it, and they're explicit about it. When they say they oppose misinformation and disinformation, what that means is they oppose free speech and content and facts and figures and opinions on public policy debates that they want suppressed. And it's happening now, and it's got to stop. And you, dear uh, viewer, are a victim. Because when Judicial Watch is censored, and we've been censored six ways to Sunday, I've been censored on Twitter, that's stopped. A Judicial Watch has been censored on Twitter. Judicial Watch has been censored on YouTube repeatedly. We've been censored and, uh, and, and repeatedly have been censored on Facebook or suppressed. Uh, I was banned from TikTok. Speaking of TikTok, I've been banned from TikTok. I don't know why. I've joked it wasn't because of my dance moves. I don't dance, at least for TikTok. Uh, it's because of the content. And they just banned me. I hope this uh, Judicial Watch federal civil rights lawsuit, I, I hope it moves forward uh, because it could provide uh, a, a way out nationally um, from this censorship morass we're in and finally uh, get the government back under control and stop making it an enemy of free speech and the people. So with that, I encourage you, given all this work we're doing, aren't you impressed? I know I'm impressed. I know I'm president of Judicial Watch and I'm supposed to be impressed. But I'm impressed as an American citizen of the scope and nature and hard work of Judicial Watch's team, our legal team, our investigative team, everyone who's behind you know, uh, educating the American people here, and frankly, those uh, great staffers who uh, raise money to keep the lights on. So I encourage you, if you're also impressed, to support Judicial Watch. You can go to our website at judicialwatch.org. You know, A, get the word out about what we're doing. Share the wealth of information uh, that the media doesn't want to cover, the government doesn't want you to know. When we get documents, it means we've had to sue, typically, and the government's been withholding this information. They didn't want you to know. Well, share that, but also help us do this work by supporting our cause, supporting our movement, and uh, directly financially supporting us with your most generous contribution. And if you've already made contributions, thank you. I encourage you to keep on supporting Judicial Watch. And if you haven't, I encourage you to begin making contributions. I think you'll be more than satisfied uh, with the work that you uh, will learn about as a result of supporting Judicial Watch. So with that, I'll see you here next time on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button and like our video down below.